we'll go into the school rooms now and I'll we'll show you how we went to school, what we did 60 years ago. I'd like to tell you children all about the one-room school. I know you don't know anything about it, but I'm going to tell you. All the grades from 1 to 12 was in one room. I mean, we had uh, uh, benches, the horizontal benches that everyone sit on. When it comes, no, I'll take that back. The horizontal benches was up in the front for us to recite from. We had our little uh, desks like you have, except we had the one with the inkwell in. Did you see some of the pictures where they stick the little girl's pigtail in the inkwell? We had the inkwells. But and each class, when it would come turn, their turn to recite, they would come up and sit on the benches in front. That we had the uh, chalkboards up in front to to, uh, to write on. And when they get finished, they go back, and another class would come up and recite. And that we was all in one room. You had to be real careful not to be listening to everybody else's class. We had uh, one teacher. She taught everybody. And when she was teaching the one grade, that grade studied. And then recess come, and we all went out, and, and we had, uh, we got a drink. And, and down there at their, their uh, place, when we got a drink, we pumped the pump. When we first came to Central, well, we were so excited because we didn't have, we had to come upstairs. We were what we call upperclassmen because we were up higher up in the, in the building. And uh, uh, we had one teacher. Our teacher was uh, Mrs. Lawrence. And uh, until we got, uh, we were just in the uh, seventh grade. So when we got further, higher up, uh, we got to trade uh, our classes. When we uh, when go to history, it'd be one class, and English, another class. We get to go to a different room, and we just thought we were something else. My brother, uh, Kimber Crank, and Bob Rosencrantz, a uh, friend of his, is in school. They're both here in school together. They wrote the Fairfield fight song that they're still using. Okay. When Fairfield, uh, from Fairfield's Red White Warriors, all in line, they did the whole. They wrote the whole thing, and they carried it through to today. They still. When you, don't you notice when you sit stand up at the in the stands how they sing the fight song? That's the fight song my brother helped write. I'm real proud of that. <laughs> it all got started way back. Way back then. Let's go back in time to the early 1800s to discover what school was like in Fairfield. Once you've had a glimpse of the past, you will see how many things have changed. The one thing that has remained the same is the pride and support our community has always shown to Fairfield schools and its children. Around 1803, early settlers in Butler County were busy clearing the land by hand and farming in order to survive. However, they were very dedicated to securing education and religion for their children. Great effort was made to find a person knowledgeable enough to educate the children. Before schoolhouses were built, those who could afford it paid private instructors 15 cents to teach one child and 25 cents for two children. Schoolhouses began to spring up in the early 1800s. Imagine yourself as a student back then. You would carry a lunch from home and walk up to a mile and a half to a one or two room schoolhouse. Your schoolhouse might be built of logs, brick or stone. Once inside, you'd find a high ceiling with a potbelly stove in the middle to heat the room. The teacher's desk was on a platform, so he or she could see all that was going on. You would sit behind two seated desks with other children from grades one through eight. While another student was reciting or writing on the blackboard, you would listen and see the subject matter. You would study spelling, reading, geography, arithmetic, writing, and English grammar. During recess, you might play baseball or marbles under a big shade tree. A well was dug and walled nearby for water. If you were an older boy, you may be offered a small sum to build fires for the wood-burning stove and to clean the schoolroom. Since you were often needed by your family to work at home during spring planting and fall harvesting, you might be as old as 18 or 19 before you had enough schooling to graduate from the 8th grade. 
As you might have just imagined, school days were very different for students of the past. They were also different for administrators, too. Back then, the Board of Education was responsible for many administrative duties. They searched for and hired teachers and principals. For example, one old district report described this recent hire. A female teacher of good moral character, about 23 years of age, unmarried, and a permanent citizen, capable of teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic. English grammar and geography. The board also outlined the days that teachers were expected to teach certain subjects. They selected textbooks to be used. In fact, each board member had to live within a mile and a half of the school. This ensured that board members always knew whether school was being kept. The board of trustees were required to report annually on the amount of time spent teaching. A report from one school district in 1837 reads that school has been taught five months and eight days. There has been $57 of school funds paid for teaching public school 42 days and $64 paid of subscription by individuals for private teaching 83 days. A five-month school term may seem surprising to us today until we remember that attendance at school in those days was determined by the farming way of life. With the demands of spring planting and fall harvesting, children were often needed to work at home. The report on months taught varied from five to eight months with the enumeration list at 45, around 19 children attended. The schools were built in a location so that no child would have to walk more than a mile and a half to school. If a few happened to be farther away, the school board would compensate. Upon completion of the eighth grade, a student could choose to attend high school with the trustees of the township paying whatever tuition was necessary. Fairfield Township, which entailed all of present-day Fairfield, as well as Indian Springs, had 13 schoolhouses. Little is known about schools 1, 2, 3, 4, 11, 12, and 13, except for their location. The school locations are as follows. School number 1 located on Ross Road. School number 2 located on Headgates Road. School number three, located on Morris Road between Mason and Tylersville Road. There were actually two buildings, one built in 1851 and one across the street built in 1870, which is now a beautiful home owned by the Moore family. School number four was called Bobbenmeyer School, located on Tylersville Road. A firehouse near Five Points now occupies the site. School number 11, now a home, was located on Princeton Pike, east of Morris Road. School number 12 was located on Middletown Pike, near Liberty Fairfield Road. School number 13 was located on Route 4, near Laurel Avenue, opposite the present-day Hamilton Plaza. A bit more is known about the remaining six schoolhouses. It's interesting to note that all except one of the structures are still in existence today. School number five, located on McGee Avenue, this schoolhouse was on one acre of ground purchased from W.F. McGee in 1869. Some pupils referred to it as the school at Locust Corner. The property was sold to H.F. McGee on November 16, 1916, when the other Sims Corner School was built. The building is now vacant. School number six was called Slade School on Carthage Pike, now Dixie Highway. The school was also known as Snaptown School. Legend has it the name Snaptown originated because of a local tavern offering whiskey made from corn in the area. Evidently, a number of people of German descent lived there and described it as schnapps, indicating that a drink could be had there. The original school was a plain, whitewashed brick building with a door in front and one in the rear. As the saying went at the time, did you go through school? The answer was yes, in the front door and out the back. A Wendy's restaurant now occupies this site. School number seven was the Sims Corner School located on the corner of River Road and Nillis Road. The one-acre site for this school was purchased from Perry Johnson on August 19, 1916. The school was in operation until 1929 when Fairfield schools were consolidated. 
The building is now owned and occupied by Clarence and Peg Yorty. School number eight was the Reeser School located on Reeser Road. The original structure was a frame building constructed before 1869 and was located in the southwest corner of the schoolyard in back of the present building. The school is now the residence of the first special education teacher of the Fairfield School District. School number nine was known as Fair Play School, located on River Road just down from the present one-way farm. For a number of years, the children from Slade and Sims Corner School were transported by bus to Fair Play School in an effort to even up classes at these three schools. This was the first use of a school bus for transportation in the district. School number 10 was known as the Stockton School that was in operation for 109 years. Originally, the school had two classrooms with 12 to 16 students. All first through fourth graders were taught in the little room and were always taught by a lady teacher. The fifth through eighth graders were taught in the big room and always by a man who also served as the principal. The first school building was a log structure which stood near where the present building is located. In about 1854, the log school was moved and replaced by a brick building with one room about 70 feet long by 40 feet wide. In 1877, this building was replaced by a magnificent new building with two classrooms downstairs, a large hall above, a belfry, and a bell. At that time, it was the best school building in the township and the best community center in the county. However, state and county officials urged the school board to centralize the school district. Stockton succumbed to centralization in 1949, 20 years after all the other schools in Fairfield Township were consolidated. This marked the end of the one- and two-room schoolhouses in our district. With centralization came the need for a superintendent. The Fairfield City School District is fortunate in having had many great leaders. The first superintendent was Mr. Rudy Augsburger. He held this position from 1929, the time of centralization, to 1941. He was followed by Mr. Dale Heskett, who served from 1941 through 1944. Next came Mr. E.C. Whitcomb. He was followed by Mr. H.M. Potts, who served as our fourth superintendent from 1945 through 1955. Mr. Robert Kropenbaker was our fifth superintendent, serving from 1955 to 1976. Mr. Dale Beckett was our sixth superintendent, followed by Dr. Gary Blade and then Dr. Larry Rodenberger. The district's ninth and current superintendent is Dr. Charles Wiedemann. To help us understand more about the history of the school district, our fifth superintendent, Mr. Robert Kropenbaker, shares his insights about some of the memorable milestones from 1945 to 1976. Mr. Kropenbaker started with the school district in 1943 as a teacher and coach and later served as both high school principal and teacher for 11 years before becoming superintendent in the fall of 1955. As I, when I came to Fairfield, it was a part of the Butler County school system and, I, and uh, may I say my tenure as superintendent up until 75. Uh, was under the uh, jurisdiction also, the, and we were cooperated with the county school system. And we had three, three superintendents who were uh, very good educators, and uh, I, they cooperated with us uh, immensely. And I shall I name uh, C.H. Williams and John Blackford and D. Russell Lee, uh, which will be familiar names to, to a lot of people. If I recall correctly, there were nine uh, buildings in the Fairfield Township, uh, elementary buildings, uh, prior to the building of, of the Central Elementary in 19, 19 and 29. And Stockton at that time was still uh, operating their own school, and they were the last to come into the Fairfield School District. As, as our uh, enrollment uh, and building program increased, it became very apparent that uh, a lot of the services that the Butler County School System was uh, uh, giving to our school district, we were uh, repeating them uh, with our own uh, people. In other words, we were covering uh, attendance and uh, department heads and transportation and all of that sort of thing. 
that the county also had originally done, and, and we were spending about $100,000 to county, uh, to the county system and uh, for duplicate services in which we were providing for ourselves. After uh, we, uh, the board decided that we were going to withdraw from the uh, county school district, then it was my duty to contact the Department of Education at the state and lay the groundwork for the uh, uh, becoming a city school district. Now you don't do that in just a, a couple of days or a couple of weeks or a couple of months. It took almost two years before it became a reality because we had to provide them with a lot of uh, statistics and paperwork and everything before uh, they would give us permission to change from a uh, local to a city school district. And uh, when I left in 75, everything uh, had been uh, taken care of and, and the groundwork had been laid and we had in our possession the State Department's uh, approval. And uh, the year after I left, it became a city school district. To give you an idea of the growth that Mr. Kropenbaker saw during his days as superintendent, Fairfield School District faced nine bond issues and 13 operating levies between 1955 and 1976. Enrollment more than tripled from 2,316 students in 1955 to 7,365 in 1976. In the early 50s, our uh, increase in enrollment and then then the subsequent building of, of the North and West School, and then in 61, the high school, then in 70, South Elementary School. And may I say that all of those, with the exception of South at that time, were added to at least two or three bond issues uh, were promoted to add to all three of those uh, schools that were formerly built because due to the increased enrollment. Well, I'd be very, very remiss if I did not at this time give the people, the parents, the citizens, and the students, and everybody connected with the Fairfield schools, uh, if I did not thank them profusely for their cooperation and their understanding, because you must remember now, uh, the district began growing rapidly during, during the 50s, and uh, during uh, my reign as superintendent, uh, through the 50s through the 60s, uh, I uh, promoted nine bond issues and 13 tax levies, and that's that's quite a bit of uh, asking people uh, for tax money uh, for the schools. And they, I will say that not all of those passed, but enough of them passed that we kept up with the enrollment uh, and uh, as best we could, and the people were we are very understanding and uh, very cooperative. Because Fairfield has always enjoyed strong support of parents, faculty, and students, the district has excelled in academics, athletics, drama, and music. Here to tell us about the music and drama program are Robert Glass, music teacher, and Paul E. Toms, former head of the music department and choral director. It was my honor to work with a great number of dedicated teachers in building the Fairfield schools and as far as the music department is concerned. A gentleman I worked with, Paul Toms, who was the music supervisor, noticed that I had done some composing in my college years and said, would you be interested in writing an alma mater? And so being very busy as I was with the, the assistant directorship of the high school band, uh, I took a song that I'd written probably several months before and said, here, Paul, this rhymes Fairfield and it should be a good piece of music. And Paul said, but we're doing it sort of the wrong way. Aren't we supposed to write the words first? And I said, yes, but I think this is a real nice tune and I think it would add something to the Fairfield community. So Paul went about it in a different manner and looked at the music and counted all the beats and, and this and that and came up with the Fairfield alma mater. It was quite simple, but I'm certain that Paul spent a great deal of hours on it turning out the quality piece of music that he did. Years ago, the Fairfield schools developed a reputation uh, for their music program that became the envy of many across the state. And I'm delighted to see that that reputation has continued down through the years. When I first came to the district back in 1960, it was very different. Only two-lane streets, no stoplights, 
a totally different world. But the excellence of the music program had already been established when I arrived and it continued to flourish down through the years. I think there were six on the music staff then and um, probably a comparable number of schools. It's been interesting to see how the growth has developed through the years. I can recall the first arts fair. The initial one was simply an art exhibition. The following years, music was added and it continued to the present day. One of the things that has pleased me the most about the music program over the years is that it has evolved as a well-balanced music program. The general music instruction has always been strong. Keyboard instruction, there's, uh, the choral program is nationally recognized. The orchestra program is the envy of others throughout the area. It's unparalleled, actually. And the bands have filled the football fields and the concert uh, halls with numbers and also excellent music. So it's been great to see it evolve with every component being strong. The story of enrollment growth continues through the 1970s, the 1980s, and into the 1990s. Fairfield Middle School was added in 1978. And in 1988, 28 classrooms were added to the elementary schools. In the year 1995, we opened the new Fairfield Kindergarten School. This school was designed specifically for today's kindergarten student. It will accommodate 650 kindergarten students in the Fairfield City School District, as well as preschool students and students in the Butler County MRDD program. The kindergarten school was formerly Southern Ohio College and was purchased to handle growth. Superintendent Wiedemann acknowledges plans to continue to accommodate the tremendous growth we have seen in our area. September 1995 saw the groundbreaking for Central's new multi-purpose center, followed by the groundbreaking of the new high school in October of 1995. By May of 1996, Central's multi-purpose center was dedicated. Groundbreaking ceremonies for the district's new East Elementary School, as well as West Elementary's new Media Center, the Freshman School, seven additional classrooms, South Elementary's multi-purpose room, and North Elementary's kitchen expansion took place in May of 96 also. As our community grows, our school district continues to move forward. With the scheduled opening of our new high school and East Elementary set for the fall of 1997, we have reason to be proud. Proud because of our community. The Fairfield City School District continues to live up to its motto, creating opportunities for our future. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you've enjoyed our video history of the Fairfield City School District. Our rich past our great community pride and your dedication will help us continue our tradition of excellence in the Fairfield City Schools. Our new facilities and expanded educational program will allow us to continue to create educational opportunities for our children now and in the future. Thank you.